Uh, we are going to read Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 15. Follow along with me. This is the word of the Lord. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, of the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Lord, we ask that you would now add blessing to your word, to the preaching of your word. Would you enable us, Lord, by your spirit to hear what you have to say to us today? Lord, we're asking that you would change us by your word, change us by this text and by all the scriptures that would accompany this text to help us understand it better. Do this, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you for being seated. Well, one of the good things that I guess you could say Facebook is good for is that uh, it has a way of reminding us what we were doing 10 years ago, if we were posting 10 years ago, which most all of us were. This past week, Facebook reminded me that I actually began my pastoral ministry 13 years ago. At the time, Michelle and I and our then four-year-old and two-year-old had left Charlotte and moved up to the mountains of North Carolina to a rural community uh, six miles from Grandfather Mountain and began pastoral ministry there as a 28-year-old or something like that. And uh, I just want to say this is an opportunity for me to say that God has been good to us. He's been faithful to us. It's amazing that I'm still standing here today. Uh, he is a good God. He's a faithful God. But I remember preparing for pastoral ministry uh, in the former denomination that I was a part of. There we had to uh, begin our ordination by taking a series of ordination exams. And so I prepared and studied for the ordination exam, and the big day came, and we arrived at the regional headquarters for our denomination. And I, my, myself, and about a dozen other pastoral wannabes uh, sat down at a table, and we were administered an exam, and we all began to start taking our exam. Well, a couple of minutes in, there were uh, a, a couple of uh, bishops, we called them, outside the, in the hallway. Uh, they were talking. These are the leaders of our denomination. They're talking, and they were, they were laughing. And so we candidates were looking around at each other, like just laughing because of how loud they were and of how difficult it was for us to, prepare, to do this exam. And so everybody just sat there quietly, and I'm just like, I've got to do something about this. I can't concentrate. And so I got up, and I, I, I very, um, I think, very gently and very calmly and very humbly went into the hallway and I politely asked the men if they would please keep it down uh, because we were trying to concentrate and we were struggling to concentrate. Well, I'll never forget what happened. The main bishop was facing away from me and he turned toward me and he looked at me with what I will describe as the look of death. And uh, one of the other bishops was very, you know, oh, I'm so sorry, we'll, we'll go somewhere else. But this guy was not happy. He was not happy that a, a lowly upstart like myself uh, dared ask him to take his conversation elsewhere. We all know that look of death, don't we? If we're a child, we know our parents' look of death. Uh, if you are a new parent, you will perfect a look of death. Uh, if you're married, you know your spouse's look of death. That sounds really crude, I guess, saying it repeatedly, but we all, we all have one. And it all comes out when someone else, usually 
when someone else dare to confront us with the truth, when truth collides with human pride. Well, I imagine that was something like what happened to Stephen the deacon in our text here. His words, which we'll see is really a presentation of the gospel, collides with the knowledge of these very high and mighty religious men. And when this happens, these men are offended. And friends, this is what happens when the gospel, God's way of salvation, confronts human pride. It it will either humble you and change you, or it will offend you or condemn you or both. Stephen's words were offensive, and it got him the look of death. Today we're going to talk about, and this is the title for my sermon, The Offensive Gospel. The Offensive Gospel. And we're going to try to understand why, why, why did what Stephen say, why was that so offensive? Why is the gospel message so offensive? Why did what Stephen said and preached so quickly bring about his arrest and ultimately his death. Stephen will become, in very short order, in our passage, our our reading of Acts, the first martyr in the Christian church. Why was it so important for Luke, the author of Acts, to dedicate 70-plus verses to Stephen's very short ministry and death. This is by far in chapter 7 the longest speech in the whole book. Why record the entire thing? Why was this message so offensive? And why is this message so glorious for the believer in Jesus? Ultimately, we want to understand why do Stephen's claims matter for the church today? What Stephen's claims, friends, matter for us today. And they matter in such a way that they are far more important than who wins the Super Bowl tonight. What Stephen believed and what Stephen preached is a matter of life and death. He will die for the things he believed. He will die for the things that he preaches. And understanding these things will determine, friends, how you and I live out the rest of our days on the earth. Will we live out our days with joy and with confidence and with humility like Stephen? Or will we live out our days offended and guilt-ridden and condemned? Today we're going to see, and I'll put my whole sermon into a sentence for you, all means of self-salvation are worthless because there is only one Savior. All means of self-salvation are worthless because there is only one Savior, and Stephen loved his Savior, and he was willing to die for his Savior. May the Lord cause this to bring conviction on us as we study in these next couple of weeks. Well, let's begin by looking at this text. Let's try to understand what's going on here in this text. Uh, You'll note that uh, if you still have your sermon reference card, we've moved into movement two. Movement two, we've had a summary statement last week at the end of verse 7. And so now, uh, moving into verse 8, we notice that Luke is beginning to, there's a subtle switch in his agenda. Luke wants us to feel that there is movement happening in this narrative. And I say that because Stephen is the first non-apostle to get significant stage time. And what Luke is doing is he's signaling that the gospel is now being put into the mouths of ordinary disciples, ordinary people. And I think he's doing that to prepare us for the scattering of the church in the beginning of chapter 8 outside of Jerusalem. So I just kind of pushed this into our next movement. The gospel is getting ready to move into wider Palestine. And we're going to see throughout Acts that this gospel is a growing gospel. It will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. And so it doesn't stay in one place. Now, in some sense, Stephen is no ordinary disciple, right? I mean, Luke tells us that God had bestowed on Stephen a special endowment of grace to empower him to do great miracles and signs and wonders and preach the word. 
In fact, it appears that in addition to serving uh, the poor Hellenistic widows from Jerusalem, which is why he was chosen in the first place, that he would, when he had his day off, maybe, spend some time in the local synagogue in Jerusalem teaching from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. The local synagogue was the place of Jewish education. It would become very important, especially after the temple fell in 70 AD. So in one of these particular synagogues, we are told by Luke, it's the synagogue of the freedmen. Freedmen were freed Hebrew or Jewish slaves under the Roman Empire. And these are Hellenistic Jews because they, they list, he lists the different places they're from, from all over the Roman Empire. These particular men were in Jerusalem and they rose up and they argued, they disputed with Stephen. But verse 10 says, they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Stephen's words were, words were clear, they were smooth, they were poignant, they were anointed by the Holy Spirit, and these guys were not happy about Stephen and his teaching. You see, friends, when the gospel confronts human pride, if it doesn't humble you, it will anger you, and it will offend you. And so friendly debate very quickly takes a malicious turn and becomes slander. The Jews are infuriated by Stephen's scriptural knowledge and wisdom, and so they do what they can do. They secretly instigate false accusations to go around saying that Stephen was speaking blasphemous or irreverent words about God and about Moses and about the law. This was a serious charge in Judaism. We're going to see at the end of Stephen's life that Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16 was fulfilled. The punishment for blasphemy was death by stoning. And so the point is, is that Stephen's argument so infuriated these men that they hated him, and they resorted effectively to, to murder. In fact, these slanderers do such a good job that they stir up the people, verse 12 says. Now, that's an important point I want to make to you. Up until now, public opinion of the disciples of Jesus in Jerusalem has been favorable. Chapter 5 and verse 13 says, The people did not dare join them, but they held the disciples in high esteem because of all the good that they are doing. Here, for the first time, we see the church begin to lose credibility with the crowds. And if the people are opposed to the disciples of Jesus, then the religious leaders who rely on public opinion to do what they do have cause to shut them down. So they arrest Stephen. Now Stephen is brought before the council. And false witnesses, men chosen to deliberately distort the truth that Stephen is speaking about Jesus, are brought in to accuse him. So again, I ask, why are Stephen's words so offensive to the religious establishment? And why are they glorious to him and to the disciples? Well, two points for you. The first is the gospel's offense. We are given the details of the accusation against Stephen in verses 13 and 14. The false witnesses were saying, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place, that's the temple, and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. So this charge against Stephen had to do with the temple, the place of God's presence, the basis of the whole Jewish sacrificial system, and it had to do with Moses' law, the commands that God gave Moses from Sinai to pass down to the Jewish people to govern Jewish life. But notice, more specifically, their accusations have to do with what Jesus claimed. That's what Stephen's preaching about. We see this in the explanatory four that begins verse 14. Some of these opponents were saying that they heard Stephen say that Jesus of Nazareth 
will destroy this temple and change the customs. So are those claims true? That's our question. If Jesus, whom the religious leaders killed, was a militant anarchist whose goal was to unravel the very fabric of Judaism by taking down these two Jewish entities, these two most sacred Jewish entities, the temple and the law, is that true? Is that who Jesus is? Well, it might surprise you that by this time, the word on the street was is that most people actually did believe that. Most people on the street believe that Jesus Jesus came to dismantle the temple system, that he came to abolish the law. Let me show this to you. Well, let's look at the temple for a second. By the time of Stephen, most people in Jerusalem believed the false narrative that that Jesus said he would destroy the temple. How do I get that? Well, you may recall that when Jesus was on trial himself, what was it that sent him to the cross ultimately? What sent him to the cross ultimately was his claim that Jesus would destroy the temple, supposedly. Destroy this temple in three days and I'll raise it up. Oh, is that what you say? And when Jesus was hanging on the cross, the religious leaders came by and they said that very thing. Look at you who say you're going to destroy the temple in three days. Get off that cross and we'll believe in you. Didn't they say that to him? Now, Jesus never actually said he would destroy the temple. The closest thing he said was in John 2. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But John said that when he was standing in the temple and said that, he was referring to the temple of his own body. But the people there began to spread the rumor that Jesus said he would destroy the temple. So the slight twist on Jesus' words, the slight emendation of his words became fact in the crowds and the people. Jesus of Nazareth and his followers have an anti-temple agenda. And that's the basis for their opposition. Secondly, let's think about the law for a second. The accusation against Stephen is that he's going around saying that Jesus is going to change the customs delivered from Moses. And of course, you know, if you study Jesus' life and teaching, his whole ministry was a war on his words. The religious leaders were constantly trying to catch Jesus in something they said, especially with regard to the law passed down by Moses. And they despised Jesus, not because he understood the law, but because in his teaching, he overruled their interpretation of it, what came to be known as the oral tradition. He showed them God's intent in giving the law. You remember when Jesus was preaching on the Sermon on the Mount? What was the phrase that was the refrain throughout his teaching? You have heard it was said, but I say to you. And he did that over and over and over again. He was was showing the people that the religious leaders are more concerned with a sort of rigid, literal obedience to the law, which, by the way, no one can do, rather than honoring its God-intended meaning. And then he had the nerve to stand up and say, for I tell you, Matthew 5.20, if your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And maybe the worst thing is that in Matthew 5.17, Jesus said that he came to fulfill the law. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Sounds like an anti-temple and an anti-law agenda. We see why the religious leaders are offended. But, as with all offense, we have to go deeper. Where does it come from? Why is it there? We have to peer into their hearts to see what's going on. You see, friends, to the first century Jew. The temple and the law were the ultimate scales by which a person could weigh the quality of their own righteousness. According to late rabbinical teaching, there were something like 613 laws that Moses passed down to the Jewish people. The rabbis then added a whole bunch more in the oral tradition. And the only way that you could tell if you were a good Jew is if you did your best to faithfully observe all of the laws that were passed down 
to you. That's how you measured your righteousness. And the scribes and the Pharisees were the best law keepers. Stephen, Jesus, Christianity was saying, you need a righteousness that supersedes theirs. You need to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And we all know perfection is impossible. Why? Because no amount of law-keeping, no number of sacrifices you can offer can remove the stain of sin. Hebrews 10 says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Only the Messiah can do that. The Messiah that Stephen preaches. Why is the gospel offensive? Because it strips the proud of their self-confidence. It removes the way of self-salvation. Tim Keller eloquently says it in Galatians for you when he says the preaching of the gospel is terribly offensive to the human heart. People find it insulting to be told that they're too weak and sinful to do anything to contribute to their salvation. The gospel is offensive to liberal-minded people who charge the gospel with intolerance because it states that the only way to be saved is through the cross. The gospel is offensive to conservative-minded people because it states that without the cross, good people are in as much trouble as bad people. Ultimately, the gospel is offensive because the cross stands against all schemes of self-salvation. You know, I don't think I've ever met a person who considers themselves not to be a good person. I've never heard a person going around saying, I am a really, really bad person. And if I were to survey everyone in this room, if you were just thinking flatly about yourself, you might say, yeah, I'm a pretty decent, pretty decent person. The gospel says the opposite of that. The gospel says that your goodness to save you is worthless. In fact, as a result of Adam, the first man, and his fall into sin, every one of us were born into sin. Every one of us by nature are spiritually dead. Every one of us by nature are slaves to sin. And the Bible well attests to our depravity. Genesis 6, 5, every intention of man's thought was only evil continually. Ecclesiastes 9, 3, the heart of the children of man are full of evil. Psalm 14, 3, all have turned aside. There is not one who does good, not even one. If you're a human being, sin pervades the whole of your being. Body, soul, mind, will, everything is tainted by sin. One writer puts it vividly, if sin were the color blue, then everything we do or say or see here on this earth would be some shade of blue. Of course, this doesn't mean that we don't possess admirable qualities. This doesn't mean that we can't do virtuous acts. But it does mean that in our natural state, friends, listen, apart from a work of God's grace on our hearts to save us, our souls, We are incapable of doing or choosing to do any good in God's sight to warm his heart to us. That's offensive, isn't it? That's offensive. Good people are just as in much trouble as bad people. But that's not what we're told by American religion, is it? American religion, now. I'm talking about churches. I'm talking about Christians. What churches, many churches teach is that people are generally good. People generally believe, don't we, Christian or not, that we have a little spark inside of us that we have that can make the world a better place. That idea has infiltrated the church. 
Most of us believe we have some good naturally in us. There's a video I saw posted recently by Sports Center, surprisingly, of Jameis Winston, the quarterback of the Saints, preaching in his church. And, and let me just say this before I finish this part. What I believe Jameis said, I believe he meant well. Okay? I'm not here to criticize Jameis. But what he said, I think, proves the point. He says this. How many times has Jesus lifted you off your feet when you didn't ask him to? Okay, good. I love that. Many times. But then he said this. That's how you know you deserve it. That's how you know you are worthy. That's how you know that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and gave us the victory. And I say yes and amen. The gospel pulls me up when I didn't ask. That's the evidence that Jesus died for my sins. But his death for me was not because I deserve it. Nor is it an evidence of my worthiness. Christ saved any of us despite our unworthiness. Again, I don't want to criticize Jameis. I believe he means well. But I bring this up because I believe that churches and Christians all over believe, albeit subconsciously, that God loved us and saved us because of some inherent goodness he sees in us. And loved ones, when we believe that, the end result is that we are going to spend the rest of our lives relying on our own righteousness to save us. We will measure our worthiness by the quality of our works. And friends, if you don't think that's true, then the next time you sin, take note of how long it takes you to look back to Jesus for forgiveness and righteousness. So often we spend hours, days, weeks, months, years trying to justify ourselves, trying to say if I just did it this way or if I wasn't handed such a bad deal, I would have done it that way or we judge others. If they didn't do this to me, then I wouldn't have done that. And then finally, in a moment of humility, maybe we look at Christ and we say, please forgive me. But they, but they. This mindset is so deeply ingrained in us, friends. If we we believe if I was just a better Christian, if I just read more and prayed more and showed up more at church and sinned less, if I could just show everyone around me that I am competent, I will finally be worthy, acceptable. Stephen's gospel is offensive because it demanded the religious leaders stop trusting in worthless sources of self-confidence to wash away the blue and instead look to the very one they killed for righteousness, for forgiveness. That's why it's offensive. But it's also glorious. So my second point is the gospel's glory. I love this little phrase in verse 15. They saw his face was like the face of an angel. What does that even mean? It's almost as if Stephen was so confident in the message he was preaching that he believed that every false accusation slid off his person like water off a duck's back. And he's aglow with faith and with joy as if he'd been with Jesus himself. That's what the gospel does, by the way, in the hearts of those who are awakened to its truth. Listen, guys, Stephen is no different from the men in that council. Neither are we. He's a sinner just like they are. He, too, was once a vessel full of divine wrath. He, too, was once as dead as the grave he too was once hopeless as a prisoner. And he too is a Jewish man like these men who once relied on the keeping of the law for his righteousness and offering up sacrifices in the temple for his sin. He's really very much the same as these men. 
But what set Stephen off from these religious men and these false witnesses and all these crowds hoping for his death is only an act of sovereign grace on his soul to show him the worthiness of Jesus. Stephen's hard heart has been opened by the preaching of Christ. I imagine he was in the crowd like the blacksmith I referred to a few weeks ago, listening to Peter preach on the blood that Jesus shed on the cross, the final sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins, and God gloriously opened Stephen's heart to receive what Peter was preaching. Friends, the only thing that make you and I differ from our unbelieving neighbor is sovereign grace. The Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, preached a sermon entitled Distinguishing Grace. He says it so much better, so I'll quote him. Why am I not at this day among the most hardened of men? How is it that my heart is melted so that I can weep at the recollection of the Redeemer's suffering? Why is it that my conscience is tender and I am led to self-examination by a searching sermon. Only grace maketh thee to differ. Our hearts would be like the wild beasts of the forest if it had not been for divine grace. Oh, I beseech you, my dear friend, every time you see a hardened sinner, just say within yourself, there is the picture of what I should have been, what I must have been, if all subduing, all conquering love had not melted and sanctified my heart. Stephen's face glows because sovereign love melted his heart. So who are my Bible scholars in the house? Can you think of another man whose face glowed? I think I heard you. Moses. Exodus 34, 29 reads, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. That's what the gospel, the person and work of Jesus does, friends, in the hearts of those who receive us, receive it. Friends, it humbles us. Friends, it brings us down. It shows us our true condition and our failure and our inability to be and to do what God demands to be made right in his sight. But oh my, does it brighten our countenance with a joy and a glory found in no other temple when we see that Christ is that glory, that he is that temple, that he is the one on whom the Shekinah glory of God rests. Friends, Jesus is the temple that ends all temples. He is the embodiment of the sacrificial system. He is the true and final place of God's presence and glory. He is the only atoning sacrifice that God has accepted for the forgiveness of your sins. And he's the only temple that God has provided by which you and I may worship the true God. Jesus is the law keeper to end all self-salvation. He's the only man who never sinned and yet who perfectly obeyed God's standard. His works alone, listen, his works alone are the works that God receives on our behalf. He is the goal and the fulfillment of God's demands and his law, which were only meant, by the way, to be a placeholder for him. When you walk around or drive around at night and you see the street lights, they give us just enough light so that we can see at night. But what happens when the sun begins to rise? They turn off. Why? Because a greater light takes over and the need for the placeholder comes to an end. Paul says Christ is the end, the goal of the law for all who believe. 
And so, friends, the glory and the offense of the gospel are the same. In Christ, all means of self-salvation are proven to be worthless. And this offends the proud, but oh my, is it glorious to those it saves. Amen. Man, I just bless myself. <laughs> my old pastor used to say that. In 1953, when Sir Edmund Hillary reached the top of Mount Everest, he put down a British flag in the snow and in the rock. But do you know that in the 50 years or so before Hillary climbed to the peak of Mount Everest, about a dozen or so parties tried the same feat and failed. Some either disappeared and were never found, or succumbed to frostbite, or to an avalanche. So why did Hillary make it? And why did so many others fail? They failed because they were overconfident and yet unprepared. Hillary, though, had a guide. His name was Tenzing Norgay. He was a Sherpa. And Tenzing was well familiar with Everest. He had climbed its faces, though never to the top, but he climbed its faces and he held the record for the highest ascent on the southeastern ridge. And yet, friends, how often do we start the day overconfident, yet unprepared, trying to reach the summit that we're never, ever going to reach? God's standard is infinitely higher than Mount Everest because he demands perfection. That standard, listen, is too high a mountain for sinners to climb by themselves. You'll never reach the top. Like many who tried to climb Mount Everest, the closer we get, the closer we are going to realize, I'll never reach the summit. Obedience to this law is only bringing me death and defeat. It is not bringing me freedom because I can't do it. I need a guide to bring me to the summit. Jesus is that only guide. Because he's the only one that can cleanse the wickedness of my heart and yet have God pronounce a verdict of righteousness over me when, let's be honest, there's only guilt there. So friends, there's my question for you as I close. What are your temples of self-salvation? What are the customs that you have adopted in hopes of saving yourself? And friends, listen, this applies whether you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ and you love him with all your heart. And it applies to you if you've never, ever trusted in him. So neither of us can tune out. What's your temple? What's your custom? A temple is anything that we look to for self-atonement, whatever that might be. Usually after we've sinned, that's what the temple was there for, right? You come up, you offer your sacrifices, you kill the animal on the sacrificial altar, and you leave. Your sins are atoned for temporarily. As soon as you left, you sinned. So you have to keep bringing your bulls and goats back in. Keep offering up your self-atoning sacrifices. So what's your temple? Maybe it's, maybe it's morbid introspection, bordering on the edge of self-flagellation. In other words, when you sin, you, you sit and you evaluate the dozens of ways that you should have done it better. And so you beat yourself up but you never come to Christ. Or maybe your temple is closely related guilt and shame. You you, you hate what you see inside of yourself, so you hate yourself. And you walk around with self-hatred, but you don't look to Christ. Or is your temple distraction, entertainment, 
things that you can do to redirect your attention away from your failings, subconsciously hoping that if enough time and enough entertainment happens and enough fun happens, I can erase the effects of my sin. But I've never looked to Christ. What are your customs? Your law? That's anything we look to in hopes of gaining some self-righteousness. The first is about sacrifice. This is about righteousness. You follow me? Maybe it's your good record. You ever see those signs in the factory, we've had this many days since we had an accident? We all tend to have those too. We have a little sign that says, it's been this many days since I failed this many days since I sinned. And if we walk around with confidence in that record, what happens the moment we break the record? Zero days now. We failed. And of course, if a record is what we're always looking at, we're always going to be looking at the record of others, the poorer records of others. And we're going to be comparing our record with theirs. And so if you're looking to your record for your righteousness, you'll stick your nose up at others who are worse than you. But then when you fail, you have to look back at yourself again. But you're not looking at Christ. Or is your customs good good habits, life rhythms? We we rely on the orderliness of our lives to keep us in the word and, and practicing the means of grace that these things give us confidence, right? We feel good. You read our Bible today. I memorized scripture. I had a gospel conversation. I did the right thing with my kids. I didn't get mad when I disciplined. I I did pretty good today. And then tomorrow, I wake up late because I missed the alarm. Or how about this one? I read the Bible this morning, and it was a glorious time, and then I went to work, and I worked with a bunch of jerks, and I lost everything. Our rhythm gets upset. Our schedule changes. The kids wake up at night. A family member comes to visit, and they won't leave. Or we go on vacation, and we wish we didn't have to go back, but we have to get back. And so our rhythms are all messed up, and our self-righteousness is lost, and we've not looked at the Savior. Or is your custom the approval of others? You rely, we rely on the affirmation of our peers, compliments about how good and godly we are, how skilled we are at our job. And so we want people to say things like, you got this, you rock, you're good, you're going to be fine, this is all you. And so our confidence is in the well-being, the well, the well done of others, rather. But we've never looked to Christ. And so it will fail us. Soon enough, our temples crumble on top of us and our customs fail to fulfill us. So we're always looking for that ultimate well done. We're always trying to get to the summit and yet we're always a little depressed and always a little angry and always a little anxious because we can never reach the summit. And then you have a preacher come along and tell you to use a John Piperism. If you ever want to feel small, go stand next to the Grand Canyon. You can't help but feel tiny when you're standing next to the Savior because he is the only perfect temple and he is the only perfect law keeper. Sean read it in our pre-meeting prayer. What the law was weakened through the flesh and could not do, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. He climbed the mountain. He alone reached the summit. His is the only flag there. But then he came down to the lowest place. And he gave himself over to the shame of a sacrifice. A naked, beaten, bloodied man on a cross. The sins of the likes of you and me. For that reason alone, 
He is worthy of our eternal praise. All means of self-salvation are worthless because there is only one Savior. And friends, that is a matter of life and death. If you get that, you'll live, and you'll live forever. If you don't, you will die, and you will die in your sin. It's worth Stephen dying for. Only one Savior. Only one can wash away the blue. Let's pray.